I would have loved to become a musician. I've been into music uh, for much of my youth. Uh, and uh, then I discovered that I had more ease in, uh, you know, going into development economics than becoming a professional musician. And this was the easy way that took the lead. Very much so. Uh, when uh, I left the ICRC the first time, it was 1991, I became uh, part of the Swiss negotiation team to the GATS, to the World Trade uh, Negotiations, leading to the World Trade Organization. So it was really going in the heart of multilateral negotiations and also bilateral <clears throat> deals to get concessions for Swiss exports and try to protect especially the Swiss uh, agriculture sector. And uh, it was um, a steep le learning curve for me for negotiations, which followed a couple of years with the ICRC, which were more negotiating or discussing with non-state armed groups. My first encounter was uh, with uh, the FMLN, so the guerrilla in El Salvador. In, by the end of the 1980s. My first encounter was to discuss about international humanitarian law with uh, uh, actually a communist guerrilla. And the leader was telling me, we don't believe in your law because you recognize private property and we don't. So we don't abide by IHL because it's a law for the capitalist world. And I was saying, oh, this was not part of my training and how do I deal with these kind of uh, discussions? But, well, back then we were bound to improvise. The value added of CCHN as I see it today here is really to provide a safe space for both informal exchanges between frontline humanitarian negotiators and between <clears throat> leaders and managers from different humanitarian organizations who come together to share experiences, but also maybe to see how we could collaborate in co-designing certain new approaches and co-designing negotiation strategies on critical emerging humanitarian challenges. One challenge will be to say, well, we have to recognize the beauty of the variety of humanitarian organizations and approaches to humanitarian action, but how can we still find common ground for collaborating and sometimes trying to present a united front when we really have to make a difference at the policy level or at the field level. I'm really struck and, and I must say impressed. There are over 2,000 participants registered. And I think in this you know, uh, phase of COVID-19 pandemic, it's probably the, the largest or one of the largest humanitarian gathering this year. And what is very special is that it combines in the, in the hybrid format, a few people here in Co, but most of uh, the participants online, which allows for actually very agile going from plenary to small groups and debating and bringing the collective intelligence from small groups back to plenaries. And I think that it really brings a lot of value added to open our minds, a way to share notes between people who are very senior, have a lot of experiences from different contexts with uh, younger people who may have less experience on, in the field, but possibly novel ideas on ways to address critical challenges. And at the end of the day, uh, securing access to the field and to the communities and providing better protection and assistance to the communities who need them.